Hey, what's up guys? And welcome back to IGCSE Success, your one-stop shop for everything IGCSE English. In today's video, I am going to be revisiting that good old question, 2D. Also known as the writer's effect question, also known as the question students love to hate, and also known as the most difficult question from paper one, arguably. Now, if you comb through my channel, you'll find lots of videos dedicated to this question, but I am forever changing the approach which I use with my students, so I thought I'd spread the love. And if you want to catapult yourself straight to the top of the mark scheme, and we're talking about band five territory, that's at least 13 out of 50, this is the video for you. Now, without a doubt, the most important thing that is going to help you guys secure a top grade is layering your analysis. And that means exploring both the explicit and implicit meanings of the images that you choose. Treat language analysis like a delicious chocolate cake. Smells chocolatey, eh? And the bottom layer of that cake is the foundation, I guess the explicit meaning of the images that you choose to use. And of course you need a foundation, otherwise your cake is likely to topple over. And well, the subsequent layers are your analytical comments, your inferences. And the more you make, the closer you will be to that delicious cherry on the top of your cake. And that's enough with the analogies. Let's get on with today's lesson. So let's take a look at how to layer your analysis successfully, especially if you are aiming for sort of band five, at least 13 out of 15. Let's just revisit some key terms, explicit and implicit. Now, explicit essentially means what the words within your image mean within the given context. And implicit refers to the suggested meaning, and that is your analysis, okay? You always want to try and layer your analysis, look at those different shades of meaning. Now, we're going to be rewinding to October, November 2017, and I absolutely love this paper. It's slightly shorter than the text C's that you get these days. I think it was about a page. The narrative is called uh, The Price of Fame, and I will link this in the description box below if you want to have a go at this question. Let's take a read. Passage A, now of course referred to as text C. The Price of Fame. Mia hated being ordinary and dreamed of being a pop star. She reached the life final of a TV show, The Talent. This is her diary entry for the day after the final. I am mortified. Yesterday was the worst day of my life. The final was to be broadcast to millions across the whole country. Just three contestants were left. The so-called glamorous granny, who sang those classic tunes that nobody cares about, the irritatingly chirpy boy band, and me. I hated the way they all laughed and chatted to the lowly technicians, and I was sick of their smiling faces on every magazine cover. They were the no-hopers compared to me. I would win because I was the most talented. All the newspapers admitted that I had the best voice, and I was feeling confident. The other contestants were so annoying that I couldn't help being snappy at them. I suppose I did criticise their song choices, and I laughed at that girl's emerald sequin dress, but it looked ridiculous on her, and the technicians were so boring that it's no wonder I ignored all of their pointless instructions. The two presenters on the show kept saying, Be nice on the way up, you never know who you'll meet on the way down, but why listen to them? I couldn't help being late for rehearsals, and the reporters who constantly, constantly hung around the contestants were irritating. Who would I bother talking to them? I don't know why they published that silly piece about me the night before the final. Diva Mia, the awful truth about a monster in the making. What was that all about? An hour before the final, I preened in front of the mirror as a stylist boon sprinkled glitter all over my shoulders. Iridescent shimmers caught the light as he fluttered about before declaring that my eyes were sparkling jewels. I admire my luminous form, practicing a few elegant dance moves as Boone muttered something about my sheer ambition. I could dazzle on stage tonight, a true star, like a comet blazing a trail. Nothing could stop me now. As my turn on stage drew closer, I tried to ignore the murmurs of the backstage staff about my constant complaining and the way everyone seemed to be reading that silly front page article about me. 
I knew I could be the winner, and if the other contestants were complaining about me, then it was out of bitterness and envy. Just because I had shouted at the hairdresser for being late, and pushed that little boy out of my way because he insisted on an autograph. It was an accident, and even his mother had to agree with me. I'm not perfect. I love my life as a singer, and I wanted fame so much. I could almost taste it. If someone has a talent, then it's a crime to waste it. Anyway, these people were in the past, and now was my time to shine. Ignoring the scowls on the faces of the backstage workers, I gave a brave smile to the presenters and waited for the signal to go on stage. I stepped into a cauldron of noise, hissing and booing, thousands of jeering voices filled the theatre. I struggled to catch my breath as my suddenly fragile voice was drowned by the audience's derision. I blinked away my scalding tears and tried again to sing the first notes. Even the band had stepped away from me, and I stood alone against a wave of anger from the audience. They hated me. Throwing down my microphone, I fled the stage into the comforting gloom of the theatre wings. Fake smiles on their faces, the presenters insisted on a comment with a cameraman looming menacingly, ready to record every moment of my collapse. My tears would be plastered all over the newspapers tomorrow morning. I would be shamed in front of the whole country. I pushed everyone away and ran down the maze of corridors, searching for the exit. Finally, I pushed hard against a door and found myself standing in a gloomy alley behind the theatre. I'd been a puppet for the media. Was this the price of fame? Now remember, even though there is arguably a formulaic approach that you want to adopt with this question, it's really important to not ignore the information given in the bullet points. So we've got A and B. And I've just underlined the important information. So A is me's appearance and attitude. B is the audience's reaction and its effect on me. So we want to try and include that key information in our topic sentences for both of our paragraphs. Of course, the overall effect is going to be different for each paragraph. Now, let's take a look at some of the images from bullet point one. Now, I have chosen... I preened in front of the mirror, sprinkled glitter, and true star. Now, with the writer's effect question, there's always more than three that you can choose. Choose the images that you are most confident in terms of being able to explore those different shades of meaning. Now, take a look at these images. What would you say? What would be your explicit exploration, your implicit exploration? Let's take a look. So, of course, preen is the powerful word in that first image. You need to explain what is meant by the word preen. So, you need to explain it within its given context. And it very much refers to one dedicating a considerable amount of time towards looking attractive in appearance. Now, in terms of what it means implicitly, your language analysis, you might explore the fact that Mia admires herself. She admires her appearance. You might also liken Mia to this bird meticulously grooming her feathers. She's preparing herself for a glitzy performance. In terms of Boone, the hairstylist, sprinkling glitter over her, yes, glitter refers to these sort of small reflective particles used to make things more attractive, but in terms of what is suggested, maybe we could explore that Mia's beauty is only on the surface. You know, glitter is very artificial. It's very temporary. Glitter is perhaps disguising the ugliness that lives within Mia. A true star, of course, that means a celestial body. Implicitly, it could be referring to Mia being ready to light up the stage uh, with a razzle-dazzle, and of course the fact that she's got these delusions of grandeur. Now let's take a look at a response which includes those three images. The overall effect of the language creates an image of Mia being overly concerned with her appearance and how she has delusions of grandeur about her talent and future. The writer begins by describing Mia preening herself in preparation for the show. The verb preen refers to someone dedicating a considerable amount of time towards looking attractive in appearance. 
Additionally, it suggests that Mia admires her beauty and that she's captivated by her own looks. Furthermore, the writer almost likens Mia's behaviour to a bird, meticulously grooming its feathers to ensure that they are in top shape, in Mia's case, ready for the brightly lit stage. The writer then goes on to describe the stylist spring sprinkling glitter on Mia's body. The word glitter refers to small reflective particles used to decorate things. Moreover, it suggests that perhaps Mia's beauty is only on the surface and that the glitter is temporary slash a superficial adornment to hide how unpleasant she is beneath the surface. Lastly, the writer described Mia as being a true star. The writer's use of the metaphor refers to Mia believing that she is a celestial body. Furthermore, it suggests that Mia considers herself to be a star on stage and is able to light up the stage slash dazzle the audience with her voice. This shows her delusions of grandeur and how highly she thinks of herself. Now, step one, we've established what the writer is trying to achieve there in the red. We've used key words from the bullet point to make sure that our response is nice and focused on what the writer is trying to achieve. And you want to try and include an adjective, a couple of adjectives or an abstract nouns to help you explain the effect. Step two, include your first quotation and zoom in. Start by explaining what any powerful words mean on an explicit level within their given context. Step three, explore those different layers, analyze the deeper meaning, meanings of words, think cake, use a range of connectives to help you. Step four, include your second quotation and repeat the steps. Step five, include your third quotation and repeat the steps as easy as that. Now let's take a look at the images I've selected from bullet point three. Hmm, what connections can you make? So I've selected cauldron of noise, hissing and booing, and scalding tears. Now cauldron of noise, looking at that noun cauldron, of course is referring to a large cooking pot or maybe a witch's cauldron. Implicitly, it could be suggesting that the audience are like a coven of witches casting a spell on Mia. It shows their detest for her. The noise is unbearable. You can't escape it. Hissing and booing on an explicit layer. It refers to these loud noises coming from the audience to show their disapproval. Implicitly, it perhaps likens the audience to some venomous snake. Are they ready to strike at any minute? It's building on that previous image of the supernatural witchcraft, etc. And of course, snakes are threatening and dangerous. That last image, scalding tears, the adjective scalding, of course, means that the liquid is boiling hot. Implicitly, it could be referring to this moment, Mia's moment, being emotionally scarring. She's been reduced to this broken performer. She's in great discomfort. She will be forever haunted by this disastrous performance. Let's take a read. The overall effect of the language creates an image of the audience being profoundly disappointed and angered by Mia's performance. The unruly audience seek to ruin her performance by drowning out her singing with their raucous noise, resulting in her feeling utterly humiliated. The writer begins by describing the cauldron of noise. The writer's use of the noun cauldron refers to a large metallic cooking pot. Additionally, it suggests that the cacophony of shouting and heckling coming from the audience is contained within the studio and there is no escaping it. Moreover, the metaphor almost likens the audience's behaviour to a coven of witches casting a spell. It's clear that they will not stop him until Mia has been reduced to a snivelling broken performer. The writer then goes on to describe the audience hissing and booing. The writer's use of the verbs refers to the thunderous noise coming from the audience in an, in an attempt to show their disapproval. Furthermore, the word hissing creates a threatening and dangerous image, building on the previous image of witchcraft. The writer seems to liken them to venomous snakes. Perhaps they are getting ready to strike at any minute. Also, it could be said that there's an almost pantomime quality to the drama unfolding. Mia is the hated villain and the audience are clearly enjoying vilifying her character. Lastly, the writer describes Mia's scalding tears. The writer's use of the adjective scalding refers to something boiling hot. Additionally, the use of the hyperbole shows how the audience have finally broken Mia. 
She's deeply distressed and is left in tears, which is causing an unpleasant stinging sensation. Moreover, it suggests there's no coming back from this disastrous performance. It will leave a mental scar for years to come. So let's dissect this response a little and look at what makes it successful. So first of all, the response looks at the explicit meaning of each image selected. We've got the analysis there. Um, I always recommend my students saying at least two things in terms of their analysis. So that's one layer explicit, two layers implicit. We've got explicit here again. We've got analysis, explicit, analysis. So follow that structure. So to finish this video, let's look at some top tips for top marks. So number one, always start with a concise sentence explaining what the writer is trying to achieve. Be sure to include an ad adjective or abstract noun. As mentioned, use keywords from the bullet points to keep your paragraphs nice and focused. Number two, start with the explicit meaning of the words first. This, I guess in many ways, acts as a springboard into your analysis. Number three, if your image has more than one powerful word, be sure to explore the effect of the words individually. That's really important if you want to secure top marks. Number four, don't worry too much about the structure of your response. Just try and organize your writing and your ideas clearly. PESA, that acronym is perfectly fine. Point, evidence, zoom in, analyze. Remember your analysis is the most important bit. After all, it is a reading question. I guess you could technically get top marks even if your structure is a little bit erratic and haphazard. Number five, going over the word limit is fine, especially if you have a lot to say about a particular image. Just be sure to explore those different layers of the cake if you want top marks. The most important thing is that you spend around 30 to 35 minutes on this question. If that means writing a page, page and a half, two pages within that time limit, that's absolutely fine. You are not going to be penalized. And there you have it, guys, a comprehensive guide on how to layer your analysis successfully. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave your comments down below, and I will see you again very soon. Until next time, bye-bye.